On June 25th, I presented a talk, not at an astrophysics conference, but at the Specposium, an informal virtual conference on the topic of speculative evolution, imagining what evolution might look like on other planets or in alternate histories. This is pretty far outside my wheelhouse as an astrophysicist, but it's definitely in my wheelhouse as a sci-fi writer. But really, it's both, because for my talk, I decided to apply the techniques of physics to the largest speculative creatures devised by writers and storytellers of all stripes. This video is a revision of that talk. I'm Alex Howe, and this is Not Just Kaiju, The Physics of Giant Monsters. Of course, if you're watching this video, you probably know the infamous square cube law already, where as you scale an animal up, its weight increases faster than its cross-section, and more specifically, the cross-section of its legs, which affects how much weight they can support. But I wanted to dig into the details and look at the specific limits that physics places on enormous creatures to figure out just how big kaiju can get, and what some alternatives might be to the usual hulking beasts we see in movies. Now, the first kaiju in film was, of course, the Ritosaurus. No, it's not the big guy. Ritosaurus was the star of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms in 1953, and in fact was the first monster to be billed as a kaiju in the Japanese release. So that's one point for interpreting the word kaiju broadly. But, as you probably know, the most famous kaiju was Godzilla, or Gojira, who made his debut one year later. And I start with him because Godzilla is a useful reference point for evaluating the physics of his weight class. So, first question, how big is Godzilla? Well, it's varied a lot. In the original Gojira in 1954, he was 50 meters tall and weighed 20,000 tons, which is actually way too much. He'd have to be made of solid iron to be that heavy. In Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah in 1991, he was 100 meters tall, and weighed 60,000 tons, which is still too heavy. And in Godzilla vs. Kong last year, he was 120 meters tall and weighed 90,000 tons, which again is still too heavy. Now, how do I know this? You can calculate it by scaling up from a human. We're not even at the physics yet, this is just math. Monster vs. Godzilla is 120 meters tall. A typical adult human male is 1.8 meters tall and weighs maybe 75 kilograms. So if you scale that up to 120 meters, you get 22,000 metric tons. Now, Godzilla is pretty chunky, so he could weigh as much as twice that, but he's not going to be 90,000 tons. That would be like a six-foot-tall man who weighs 700 pounds in American units. Here's another example. This is Slattern from Pacific Rim, one of the largest kaiju you'll see in film. But Slattern has the opposite problem. He's described as being 180 meters tall, which means he's got to be upwards of 300 meters long. That's the size of an aircraft carrier. But his official weight is only 6,500 tons. So he's made of styrofoam? He certainly needs to be heavier than Godzilla. But how much should he weigh? Well, Slattern is quadrupedal, so I'll scale up from my estimated length of 300 meters to get... 350,000 metric tons. Somebody definitely did not do the math here. Also, if you don't think a human is the right reference point to scale up from for a quadrupedal animal, you could use an elephant or a whale or something similar. But that's just to figure out the correct weights. The real question is how big plausible speculative beasts can get. And it's not really even about the square cube law so much, because the biggest limitation is probably height. Height is a problem because it relates to pressure. Typical pressures in animal bodies are a fraction of an atmosphere. If you take the standard blood pressure for humans of 120 over 80 and convert it to atmospheres, you get 0.158 over 0.105. One atmosphere corresponds to just 10 meters of water, and a large animal's blood pressure needs to be greater than its heart-to-head height difference. And that becomes a problem pretty fast. You can see that with the tallest animal alive today, the giraffe. A giraffe's neck is two meters long, maybe a bit more for large specimens. To pump blood that high, it needs a blood pressure that's twice as high as humans, and it has several adaptations to deal with that. 
Of course, it has a huge heart to deliver that pressure. But when it bends down to drink, it needs to block some of that pressure because it turns out it's bad to have that much pressure in your brain. So the giraffe has a vete mirabile in its neck, a net of small blood vessels that interrupts the blood flow and acts as a natural pressure regulator. Meanwhile, very tight skin and muscles around its legs act as natural compression stockings against the fluid pressure from above. And they're so efficient that they're studied for the design of G-suits. So even growing an animal this tall presents challenges. But when we look at the fossil record, we can find animals that were much taller. This is Giraffe Titan. It was up to 12 meters tall, and about 8 meters of that was neck. Even if it didn't hold its neck fully upright, it had about three times the problems with blood flow that a giraffe has. And the related sorrel Poseidon was thought to be even taller. So how tall can you go with speculative creatures? Honestly, I'm kind of surprised even this tall worked. And something the size of Godzilla would need to deal with three or four atmospheres of pressure. That seems pretty much impossible for Earth life. But in Spec Bio, you might be able to find ways around it. Extra hearts, maybe? Or even separate circulatory systems? Reinforced arteries for blood transport? Trees can have that much negative pressure to lift water th with their woody structures, so it's probably feasible. Or maybe you could take inspiration from engineering. Here's a structure that's designed to move water up and down by 26 meters, and it could go higher if it needed to. So there are options, but it's still a pretty major difficulty. Height isn't the only problem. The most obvious problem of an animal that large is energy requirements. A human needs 20 kilocalories per kilogram per day of energy, and kaiju are well into the millions of kilograms. That's a lot of food, but there's an important complication we need to consider. Are kaiju warm-blooded or cold-blooded? There's a long-standing debate about whether large dinosaurs were warm-blooded, cold-blooded, or gigantotherms. But I contend that for even larger animals, they have to be gigantotherms. Here's a fun exercise that we did in intro astrophysics class when I was an undergrad. If the sun were made of human bodies, would it be hotter or cooler than the real sun? Well, we can estimate it. And I talked about techniques used in physics... Well, this is a popular one, especially in astrophysics, called a Fermi problem, where you make a rough order of magnitude estimate just to get a general idea of the answer to a question when it doesn't need to be exact. A human body produces 1 to 2 watts per kilogram of heat, depending on your weight and lifestyle. The mass of the sun is 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, so that's 2 times 10 to the 30th watts. But the actual luminosity of the sun is only 4 times 10 to the 26 watts meaning a sun made out of human bodies would be 5 to 10,000 times brighter than the real sun. And if you do the math, 8 to 10 times hotter. Now, in practice, an object with the sun's mass and that much luminosity would rapidly expand into a red giant or even a red supergiant, but the initial conditions are way hotter. In other words, for very large living things, shedding heat is a big problem, not staying warm. And we can kind of expect this as another consequence of the square cube law. So, kaiju should be obligate gigantotherms, which means that we can safely use the equations for cold-blooded animals, which have about 10% of the energy requirements of warm-blooded. How much energy is that? Well, the pure square cube law says that the energy needed to match heat dissipation scales as mass to the two-thirds power. But Kleiber's law, which is regarded as more accurate for real animal metabolisms, says energy scales as mass to the three-fourths. And this is another popular technique, actually in a lot of sciences, but especially in astrophysics. Scaling laws, where you don't worry about the exact formula for something, but just look at the power law relation between two quantities. Now let's apply this formula to Godzilla. If we start with something human-sized and scale up to the correct mass of 22,000 metric tons using Kleiber's law, we get... 2.5 million kilocalories per day. Surprisingly, Godzilla should only need to eat about as much as 1 or 2,000 humans. If you compare the estimated Neolithic human population of 5 or 10 million, this suggests that Godzilla's could sustain a breeding population of about 5,000 worldwide. There's only one of him in most of the movies, but he had to come from somewhere. But the main limitation here 
is that you probably couldn't go much bigger and still have a viable breeding population. Now for the all-important question regarding giant monsters, but what about dragons? Points if you got that reference. There are a lot of additional problems if you want your spec creature to be able to fly, and usually flying means dragons. If you have a creature that is both giant and flying, people are probably going to think of dragons. Dragons have a long-standing tradition in media, but if you look at some examples, the Hungarian Horntail, Drogon, Smaug, especially the Peter Jackson version, they start to look increasingly implausible with increasing size. And eventually you get up to Ancalagon the Black from the Silmarillion, who was said to be the size of a mountain. Or at least they have the power of a volcano. Size doesn't exactly scale with power in Tolkien. And that's actually something you see a lot in both literature and folklore. The monsters can be a lot bigger. Sizes of miles aren't that uncommon there, where they just wouldn't be photogenic on screen. Regardless, really huge flying animals just don't make sense. The limitation for flying animals is wing loading, which is the amount of weight per unit wing area. Since it's weight divided by area, the square cube law is in play, and it will be higher for larger animals. And the reason it's important, besides structural strength, is another scaling law, which states that takeoff speed scales as the square root of wing loading. So if the wing loading is too high, the animal just can't get off the ground, if it has enough energy to fly in the first place. And if you look at typical wing loading values and keep in mind the takeoff speeds for various animals and aircraft, you can conclude that a flying animal larger than a jumbo jet seems very unlikely. So, those are the limitations on traditional kaiju being the size of buildings. But if you still want to include giant monsters in your spec world, what are some alternatives? Well, you could do what nature does and keep them completely underwater. That would work, although it's maybe not the most interesting. You could make your monsters longer instead of taller. The sandworm and the space slug are already at the upper end of the size range for kaiju, and they're still pretty interesting. The blob is another option. It doesn't get that big in the movies, but the principle is the same. Just keep it flat to the ground and it can get bigger. You could invoke Hitchcock. A flock of starlings can weigh as much as a kaiju, and could be just as intimidating if they're angry. You might also think of the giant locusts in the new Jurassic World. Or maybe a little of both. This is Pando the Aspen Grove. It's a clonal colony made of 40,000 individual stems. It's only 25 meters tall, so height isn't a problem, but it's a kilometer wide and weighs 6,000 tons. That seems like a good fit. But what would it look like as a monster? Switch the tree trunks for tentacles, maybe? I think that would be a pretty scary monster. Although, you might want to be careful with that, or you might get pigeonholed as a certain kind of story. And I'll just move on from there. Or you could take it to space. In space, there's no gravity and also more, well, space. And you can have creatures grow as large as planets. But would that really work? Or are there still limits? Well, if it can get food in space somehow, and doesn't need to breathe, and can move under its own power, and can shed enough heat, pressure is still a problem because an organism that large will have its own gravity. So here's a bonus lesson. What is the pressure at the center of a uniform sphere? To figure this out, we compute the gravity at radius r, then the pressure differential across a thin layer, and integrate over the radius. If we set a limit to the central pressure of one atmosphere, and give it the density of water, the maximum radius is 26.9 kilometers. And note that the pressure scales with the radius squared, so you really can't go a lot bigger than that. A space-based life form can't very easily grow larger than a medium-sized asteroid. On the other hand, there's still an exception to this, which is... It could be just the surface layers that are alive. This is Solaris, specifically the George Clooney version. Which is a planet covered with an entire sentient ocean which still goes over one atmosphere pretty quickly with depth, but it could still get around the size limit. Or it might just not be solid at all. Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud may be the single largest physically plausible organism in the literature, and it's essentially a sentient nebula with the mass of Jupiter. 
So traditional kaiju might not work very well, but there are a lot of other options to design truly massive creatures in Spec Bio. So if you get creative, you can probably figure something out.